Good morning. Um, thank you for joining us for the 2017 college annual session. My name is Stephanie and this is Sarah. We're representing the University of California, San Francisco. Um, and we'd like to thank first our sponsors, Boyd and Weave, for continue, continuing to support our specialty. In addition to that, we'd also like to thank each and every one of you for being so kind and welcoming this weekend. It's our first time here and we really feel like it's such a family environment, so thank you for that. Um, there are a few more housekeeping rules. Um, following Dr. Prophet's lecture at 11.45, there will be a Q&A session with all of the speakers thus far. Another one, please place your cell phones on silent mode or off during the duration of the lecture. CE certificates can be picked up Tuesday afternoon. Again, this course is worth 1.5 CE credit hours. And now Sarah here will introduce the very esteemed Dr. Perry Open. Hi guys, um, Dr. Perry Open Bachelor's of Art degree was earned at Col uh, Colgate University and attended New York uh, University for his dental degree. He was awarded the Founders uh, Day Award for graduating in, uh, in the top 5% of the class, the C.V. Mosley Award for Academic Excellence and was elected into Omicron Kappa Epsilon Dental Honor Society. He continued on to earn a master's degree and certificate in orthodontics and served as the captain in the U.S. Army Dental Corps. Dr. Open is an active member of numerous professional organizations, including American Board of Orthodontics, the Angle Society, the Northeastern Society of Orthodontists, the Connecticut State Dental Society, and the American Association of Orthodontists. He has also received a United States Public Health and Training Fellowship grant for the treatment of cleft lip and palate and craniofacial defects from the Lang uh, Lancaster Institute. This is the first institute in the United States dedicated to treating craniofacial anomalies. Currently, he's also the Connecticut, uh, the, con uh, the consultant for the Connecticut State Department of Public Health for craniofacial disorders. Uh, please welcome Dr. Perry Open. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Well, first off, I want to thank everybody for being here so early in the morning. Um, I hope you all are having a wonderful time as we are. And I think that there's somebody here that hasn't been recognized, and I think we should all uh, recognize them appropriately, appropriately, and that's our president, Dr. Miller. Dr. Miller, would you please stand up and uh, be re Amongst this uh, Austin group here, it is very humbling for, to be asked to speak before you. I've had the pleasure of speaking here before, and I've certainly learned so much from so many people. The lecture this morning talks about impactions, impactions why me, and as everybody knows, uh, it, is, it can be a real problem. And I'll tell you at the outset, what this is going to talk about is how can we deal with impactions, primarily cuspids, with no surgery to um, allow these teeth to erupt in the mouth. Um, what amazed me was when I was going through the literature that there is some material on this subject because uh, I, I will explain later how I came on to this, uh, what we do today, because I'm an old man. I've been doing this a long time. Uh, and uh, it's something that I enjoy doing uh, if, I, if it's successful. And I believe in our office we are successful well over 90% of the time. 
given one thing, that we see the kids early. Okay? So much for that. Now, uh, a little of this, and let's get going. All righty. Everybody needs what needs to understand what is an impacted tooth and its necessity for treatment. And for years, I, I really didn't understand the word impaction. What's the difference between an impaction and an overretained tooth that, at what point does the overretained tooth become what you would call an impaction? The uh, tooth, we're talking here about the uh, tooth remains beyond normal shedding time and the permanent successor that is due to come in, wherever it may be, is three quarters of its expected root length. And at that point, I think it's fair to call it impaction. I would also say that it's fair to call it a tooth an impaction if you take a panoramic x-ray and you see something that looks like it's going horizontal, that you can bet your life um, you're going to have a little problem with this. An impacted tooth is one that's not expected to erupt in a reasonable time. Well, the prevalence. Let's talk a little bit about etiology, diagnosis, treatment, and prognosis. Etiology. There are many theories about this. Um, and I, I, I don't think it's ever been decided what is the etiology, I believe it's sort of like many other, end quotes, diseases, it's multifactorial. But there are certain things that are common about it, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, Broadbent, way back when, talked about a torturous pair of, of eruption. And I remember, it's hard for me to believe, but I remember when I was in school, when wheels were square. Um, I like that. Um, we were told the same thing, that because of the tortuous path that you had, particularly of the maxillary canines, this was the etiology. Well, I think it's pretty clear that it's not just that. Um, and unfortunately, it occurs too often. Some of the other things, of course, trauma. And trauma, uh, I'm sure you've all seen this, where a youngster's had some kind of a uh, deciduous accident, knock the front tooth out, and then the permanent tooth is there, you look at it, the central incisor, and it's not coming in. And it's often soft tissue problem, nothing more than that. When you laser off or have, some, have a surgeon or periodontist or a general dentist uncover the tooth, it will erupt. So that's the simple stuff. Uh, congenitally missing deciduous or permanent teeth. This is something that you'll see constantly. If you look at the uh, patients that you see with impactions, it is almost, you, it, well over 50% of the time, you're going to see a deciduous tooth somewhere. I, I'm sorry, a pig-shaped tooth somewhere. You're going to see things like uh, congenitally missing teeth in the mouth. Um, and the first case I ever saw, which I'm going to show you today, uh, which uh, is way back in, in black and white times, uh, you'll see what I'm talking about, but I'm sure many of you have noticed it. So um, the heredity issue, McNamara came up with that as late as 2011. And like I said, there are many theories. The bottom problem is, with theories is it doesn't solve the problem. And if we did know uh, what, the, the, uh, what the actual cause of, maybe we could eliminate it and eliminate a lot of aggravation for a lot of people. Complications of untreated impacted canines. Well, you all know this. There's the morbidity of a deciduous canine, uh, cystic changes, locally invasive, uh, re early res uh, resorption of teeth, primarily the lateral incisor, but I've seen them take the root off central incisors as well. And that's something that you would like to correct. Um, another place where you will see if you deal with this problem Impactions are very, very, very uh, common. 
in cranial facial cleft palate cases. Happens extra teeth, missing teeth, uh, impacted teeth, uh, malformed teeth, etc. All right, palately impacted canines. The prevalence is about one to two and a half percent of the population, and the women outfit, outrank, outrank the men three to one. It's the second most impacted tooth, and of course the wisdom teeth be the primary number one place. And the ratio of palatal impactions from uh, palatal to labial is eight to one. Um, prognosis. Well, I talked a little bit about early. Root length, type and height of the periodontal attachment because that's key to what you're doing. Crestal alveolar bone height, and the preservation, you want to pre preserve vitality. Sign, signs of delayed eruption or impaction. Three quarters of the root formation, failure of deciduous tooth for eruption, resorption, I'm sorry, abnormal eruptive patterns, supernumerary teeth, odontomas, cysts, crowding, and thickening of the post extraction or post trauma repair which we just talked about of mucosa. And there's a little cystic, uh, little, little nasty right there. Now the timing of the extraction of supernumerary teeth or odontomas, uh, if, I'm gonna use one word which I, I would ask or suggest to all of you. Have patience with this problem. Have patience because it takes time for these teeth to erupt, uh, particularly in what we do, but it will work, and it will work a lot. Over, I'm telling you, over 90%. In fact, the only two times I've ever had a problem with an impaction not erupting as I wanted it to, they were both labial. One was an adult woman, and uh, it was uncovered, and that sucker just was ankylosed, and it wasn't going with, and the other one was a young man. But the palatals seem to be, um, we've been very lucky, very lucky. So it, it says it, if you see in a, a supernumerary tooth or an odontoma, get it out of the way. Um, the problem is the emotional impact on your patients. When a mother comes in, to, or a father, and with a new, as a new patient, and you take a screen, first off, they allow you to take a screen of the patient and you discover an impaction, which they had no idea was there, because dentists, you know, I asked it, they get asked this question, and I don't know how you all handle it, but I'll tell you how I handle it. And my son, who handles it better than I do, he does be everything better than I do. Uh, you'll hear from him tomorrow after, uh, late lecture tomorrow afternoon if you're here, I hope so. Anyway, I explained to the mothers that the dentist is looking for cavities and caries. They take bite wing x-rays. They're not gonna pick this up. And it's not their fault, it's just what it is. But they sent you here, and this is what we've got, so let's see how we're gonna deal with it. And that's it. So, <laughs> it, it, you know, there are some parents that say, just do what you gotta do. And there are others that are going, oh my God, and then, they, they're, of course, they're thinking, how am I going to get even with this thing? Because he, it should have been picked up earlier. And I tell them, no, no, no. And anyway, it, it, that, you've got to handle it with kit gloves. The screening radiograph on developing the deciduous dentition is extremely important, as you well know. And the radiographs, as you know, the periapicals, which is gone, it, it shouldn't be that panoramics, the occlusal films, and of course your cone beam, uh, which is just added to all kinds of stuff we do today. And the things to look for are some root resorption on permanent teeth in there, i.e. a lateral incisor, uh, root pattern and integrity. What have you got? I know we have a patient now, I think it's already happened, who had a lower left permanent first molar. Man, it was a mandibular, and I could not get this tooth to move. And I'm, I'm just 
So I took it, when we took the original records on this child, uh, the permanent molars were not fully formed. Well, I found that I had a little surprise, and that was that the low, that same tooth had developed a hook, an absolute right, it was going distal. And so, of course, I sent him over to the oral surgeon, and uh, they said to her, you better, you know, we may need to do what he calls surgical uncovering, which means I gotta go get that root. I'm hoping that it won't happen, but I don't know how it's going to, you know, I think we're gonna lose the tooth. And uh, that's a problem. And of course, the presence and the description, uh, description of your hard tissue, and the, well, I'll get to that in a minute. The surgical uncovering, and you know all this stuff, um, you want good access, a, a dry bloodless field so you can bond, removal of obstructions. We like to go to the oral surgeon's office, if we can, and place the bonds ourselves. And the reason is direction. Uh, even though I've got an x-ray or I may have a cone beam, which we do, I want to see it. And so we will go over there, it doesn't take long, and, uh, repl and place the whatever is there. Um, and the, 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 the traction, I'd like to start it right away, but, but, and I'm going to talk about this, you don't want to do it depending upon how submerged the crown of the tooth is relative to the bone around it, okay? And I'll explain why in a minute. You've got your force modules, you know all about this stuff, so I'm not even going to talk about it. And the, the elastic thread is really the easiest way to go, and especially in your in, um, in a surgical office or whatever, and he wants to get out of there, he wants to get finished, et cetera. The, there are multiple problems with it uh, in that they do, none of it really works over a period of time. They're, they can be used for direction simply if you put a coil spring on in the area of the uh, impacted tooth between the, set, the lateral incisor and the, the uh, first bicuspid, you can tie, as you know, any way from mesial to distal, which will help you in your directions. The other thing we like to do, well, I'll get, wait a minute, I'm getting ahead of myself. Coil springs, they work much better because they got much better force, con constant force, especially today, but they have the same problem somewhat in direction although you can eliminate the same way I just talked about, or um, you don't want to do it if the tooth is not ready for this. And I'll get to that, I will, as to where it is relative to the bone. And the cantilevers, what we do with them is we actually form them before the patient goes to the oral surgeon. So when we walk in the door and take a look at it, we put the bond on, and if it's okay, if we can do it, we're activating it right away. I do believe that it's one of the reasons we are, what I think is very successful with these, the treatment of what you got. The uh, impaction treatment sequence, and again, you know all this. You diagnose it, you ban, you bond. You, now this, what I'm talking about, is setting up your teeth because you wanna have room for the canine to come in before you go and have it surgically uncovered or if you, or, or, that is if you want to um, not only get, uncover it, but you want to move it right away, you want to have some place to, for force. But you get back to the same thing. When do you want to do this? Do you want to do it all the time? And I would suggest to you, no, you do not want to do it uh, if, if you've got a problem with the bone. And I'll get to that. So you set up your, anchor, your anchorage and you know, you got enough room. And then if you've got what we're gonna talk about, the, a posterior TPA and you can do it, you may wanna pull the coat tooth distal before you move it mesial or distal, uh, move it uh, lingually, I'm sorry. And, um, and then of course the cantilevers and that, that you go like that. Uh, again, uh, removing all the obstructions, obviously bond the eyelet, activate at time of surgery if the crown is clear of bone. And I thank Dr. Kokic uh, for this. 
because I couldn't understand how the hell I was having so many pr problems in moving teeth in some cases, and others, it went zip and I look like a hero. Well, I look like I look. I'm no hero. So um, anyway, so we would reactivate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And when the tooth was in some position, we could you know, get a regular bracket on. We would rebracket the tooth, bring it in the mouth, and we're done. Uh, this is a little picture here of your setup. And uh, I don't know if you can see this, but let's see how this thing works. Hmm. Let's try this. Ah, there you go. Your cantilever is here. It's, uh, this particular cantilever runs off the, mo the molar. It's got double tubes in there. Actually, it got triples. And I've got a, a transpallel arch in here for two reasons. Number one, um, I've got these. I want to hold my width. I don't want these teeth dragged forward if I can help it. And I also don't want rotation to occur. So, uh, and then you can see them there. All right. This is a uh, case of a young lady that is unfortunately typical of what you see. She came in and uh, we took a panoramic x-ray and this is what we saw. So, I would suggest to you, thanks to Will Prophet for that comment, that this canine is not coming in any normal manner. Um, looking down here, at the, the lower second molars may be a problem, but maybe not. The wisdom teeth, uh, I think you could bet the, bet the farm and the house on the farm that they're going to be horizontal impactions. So anyway, that we've got to deal with that. So we did the stuff we're supposed to do. In that we got rid of this deciduous canine after we did all the rest of this stuff. And then, well, I'm sorry, but this is the finish on the case. We did not extract any permanent teeth. And I think the results are pretty good. Now notice over here, there was a wisdom tooth there before. There, it's not there anymore. This single tooth was removed because mama said, don't take the rest of them out of there. I said, okay, what are you gonna do? And uh, it allowed us to get this tooth up in the mouth or in the mouth without a problem. And the finish is here. So this is what I'm talking about with Dr. Kokich. May you rest in peace. Um, Vince was a very good friend of all of ours. He was a friend of this organization. He was a friend to my, my son, and that his son, Vince Jr., was to De Tufts Dental School, and he was my son's little brother. So we had a lot of, lot of things that were there, and a wonderful man that we lost, and um, I, I think about him often, I really do. Anyway, what he said and what he told us was, you uncover a tooth and let it erupt on its own before you begin orthodontic treatment. And if you recall, how many of you were here when he lectured on this subject? Oh, good. But those of you who were not, let me just try to reiterate what he talked about. He had a patient that he was going to treat. Patient went out and had teeth uncovered surgically, impactions. I can't remember if there were other teeth extracted at the same time, but that's what occurred at that time. Patient disappeared for a year. Came back, the canines had erupted. Both of them were right smack up against the lateral incisors when they were uncovered, and they moved lingually, and they erupted. And from there on, he did what he had to do. And that taught me something of why I was not being smart enough to move teeth. And the reason was bone and crowns enamel don't like each other. And so you can f put force on there, and you're going to just struggle and struggle and struggle till you can get this tooth to move in the direction you want it to. So the, the drawback to talking about the and this is all impactions done surgically are too. The emotional effect on a parent and or a child, a patient, and of course the cost that the oral surgeons charge, and they're certainly entitled to get paid for it, 
but it's there and it, it has to happen. Uh, they, they not only do their job, but they got to get paid for it. So, in my neck of the woods, uh, money is very important because I live in the state of Connecticut. I guess you could call it state of chaos. I should have started with this. Now, right now, and I know it has nothing to do with this, but when I talk about money, we have just lost Aetna. We have already lost UPS, uh, FedEx. Um, I can't tell you how many different... Um, I, anyway, the bottom line is we are the richest state in the union and the most indebted per capita in the country. Think about that a minute and think about that if it was your office. Are you kidding me? Are you serious? And that's exactly what it's like. So that people, we used to be, particularly lower Fairfield County, money, you, you couldn't even imagine the amount of money some of these people make. But now, they're getting out, and I find very simple, and you may run into the same thing. By the way, we have no budget for now either. The, the governor's fighting with the legislature, the Democrats want to give away the store, raise the taxes, blah, blah, blah. And the Republicans say you gotta slash and burn, and the Republicans are in the minority. So I don't have to go any further to tell you where, what's gonna happen. But every time, I would say once a month, we have a family come in and say, Thank you for your service, Dr. Open, but we're moving to South Carolina. We're moving to Florida. We're moving to Arizona. Why? Why are they doing it? Well, it's real simple. There's no income tax there. And in our state, if you buy a car, and you're gonna go out of here and say, what the hell are you talking about? Anyway, if you buy a car in our state, you're gonna pay a tax on that car forever. And I don't mean just a license. You pay for it when you buy the car, the next year they evaluate the car, and whatever the value is, they tax you on that, and it goes on every, all, there's no breaks to it. What I'm trying to tell you is there's a better place to practice as far as the fight than in Connecticut, but uh, whatever. I wish all of you don't have any of those problems. Okay, so this is another young lady we, t we saw, and she had a double impaction. And if you note, we've got a, a missing permanent tooth here. Uh, we've got a missing permanent tooth here. And we've got a single root on this, this, this space maintainer, if you will. So we've got all this going on. And then your bicuspids, they want to come to meet the central incisors in an eruption pattern. And of course, over-retained deciduous tooth here. So, we had it surgically uncovered. We placed the bonds. We moved the teeth. And you'll notice on the lower, this popped off. And for one reason or another, we brought the one, the one tooth in sooner than the other. And you can see here the setup and the, the we finally got this rebonded, and you could see the activated uh, sectional here. And of course, this was the other side. And what we do with this, before, we pre before the tooth is uncovered, we will set this up, and then we tie it to, on the, to the arch wire, because otherwise it would be sticking in her cheek. And uh, you could see the triple tube up here, that if we run into any kind of problems, we can do what we need to do. Okay, so we've got another patient, and I'm sorry about the finish on that because Gary said, I don't know what happened to it, neither do I. And similar situation here, two mesial impactions of palopactions of two permanent canines with complete roots. The chances of uh, getting these teeth in on their own without any kind of surgical uncovering, I would, I would suggest to you is zero. So of course, they went to, uh, we set this up again, and uh, you can see what we've got here. And uh, I'm gonna back off, I'm sorry. And uh, here's our, our um, active 
force coil springs here, case, and you'll notice how we've directed this this way. And this, I'm not quite, well, I know why. We're going to move this thing. Uh, we've got to move it distal before we can uh, get it in the mouth. So that's what we, our typical setup, which is nothing new to you. Um, extraction, now there's a lot of inf information out there that until I was asked to speak on a subject, I had no idea. Because we had been doing this in the office since the early 70s. And when I show you what we're doing, which we still do this day, uh, with early uh, discovery of uh, impactions, um, the, uh, the, the, there is a lot of literature, done a lot of studies on extraction of canines. Is it adequate for permanent teeth to come in? Or do you leave the deciduous teeth in and the teeth will come in on their own? Um, Somebody's calling somebody. I missed it, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you, you got it. Um, when Hillary Clinton was getting elected as president, no booze please. Okay, our governor was on his, her shirt tail. I mean, if she turned sideways or backed up, he'd fall over because he was that close to her. And I couldn't wait for her to be elected, not because I wanted her elected, but I knew she was gonna take our governor with her. And so I suggested to my Democrat, uh, to my Republican colleagues, I'm paying for the moving van. So, yeah, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's bad. Anyway, getting back <laughs> to what with the governor. Who said that? That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. You did that, Sobler? Terry, you're a funny guy. Thank you. You keep me smiling all the time. Uh, he's our, almost our president. I'll be inducting him if he behaves himself in in less than an hour or an hour. So what can I tell you? Anyway, depending upon who you listen to, as to what you do depends upon the time of the day, what they see. And I, I would suggest to you that none of the material that, is, that I see and read makes any sense, and I'll tell you why. If you take a, a vertical impaction and it's hold, held up by a, an over-retained deciduous canine, Unless the world ends, that tooth's coming in the mouth, you do nothing more. Take that same patient with a high horizontal impaction, take a deciduous tooth out, and see what happens. Good luck. Those are the times when you've got to do something more than simply taking. Now, that's my opinion. That's not written here by anybody but it just bothers me because all impactions are not the same any more than we're all the same. So you've got to look at the difficulty, the eruption pattern of the tooth, et cetera, et cetera. And when I give you these statistics, take them with a grain of salt because they're talking about a bunch of patients. They don't tell you what they, what, how, there is one, one I'm sorry, there is one paper out there that levels of difficulty from one to five and the five would be that the impacted canine's tip of the root, when you take the panoramic x-ray, is over to the mesial of its corresponding central incisor, if you follow me. And he does talk about difficulty, but nothing can be done from a statistical standpoint. These are times when you gotta use your head, okay? So, anyway, Siegler, et cetera, decided that uh, rapid expansion and transpill arch treatment associated with deciduous canine extraction on the eruption of displaced canines. It was a two-center perspective study, and it, there were not a lot of people in it. There were controls, et cetera. And they said the success rate of just the extraction of deciduous canine 
with no treatment, the success rate is about 35%. If you extract the primary canine alone, 65%. And as this is my part, how it's dependent on the position of the impacted canine. That's my own stuff there. And I said, the more horizontally displaced the crown is toward the central, the less the success. Okay, that was also suggested that you'd extract your canine, deciduous canine, and you put a headgear on these patients, and you get a success rate of over 87% versus the extraction of a primary canine only of 65%, and it, what it does is it prevents the mesial migration of posterior teeth. And a, a Bassetti, who has done a lot of work, he's got a number of papers out there, he, you know, I see it as a problem because if your pa patient is already a class one or a class three, what do you do with a headgear? And the biggest question is, are they gonna wear the headgear? I mean, I've seen them on dogs, I've seen them um, the, I, my, how many people here routinely use headgears? That's a lot of people. And how many people have some difficulty in getting some patients to wear their headgear adequately? And, and thank you. And those of you who do not have uh, any difficulty, uh, would you please come up here right now and tell everybody how you do that? <laughs> okay, so much for that. I know what I used to do, I used to tie them in. Now the problem is sometimes the mothers would get hysterical, never mind the kid. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Okay, so this paper by Siegler, et cetera, again, effective rapid expansion and transpellar arch treatment associated with deciduous canine extraction on the eruption of palatally displaced canines, a two center prospective study. He showed that he stated that he had a 40, sub, 40 subjects as control group, um, I'm sorry, 40 with the treatment and 30 with the control, and the success rate of treatment group was 80%, and the, sex, uh, the success of the untreated group was 28%. 80% is really good, I would suggest, except for one thing. If your kids wanted a 20%, not so good. And uh, you know, when you mention the word surgery to a parent, you better say it nice and slow, very quietly, and then duck, because they're not happy. Okay. Associations with pallet displaced canines. These are things you will commonly see, and I'm sure all of you know it, but I wanna go through it with you anyway. Contralateral, peg-shaped lateral incisors, all the time. Congenitally missing permanent teeth, you bet. Distally displaced erupting mandibular second premolars, look for them. An infraclusion of deciduous molars, and I got one of those going to the oral surgeon too. There's no permanent tooth under it. I want him to see if he can crack it loose and we'll build it up, or if he can't do it or he feels he can't do it, I will leave this is, now this is heresy. I leave the deciduous molar as long as one, it is not tipped in an ankylose position. In other words, it actually tips over as opposed to being flat. And two, if there are gonna be little or no roots left, because as long as that tooth is there, and you, when you finish your treatment, and it doesn't affect either your occlusion or it does not affect um, the, its position as far as having to have this tissue removed to get the tooth out of there. What I ask the, the doctors to do, the dentist, is we know it's ankylose, we know it's dropping down, and if it's holding its width, and it happens, I tell them to build it up to a normal height and that'll last for a long time, sometimes a tremendous long time. Because the kids are certainly at, you know, you're 14 years old, especially males, they're not ready for implants. There's no way. And so I try to hold on to these things. We, 
Gary, I'm sorry. I keep talking about I. We try to hold on to them as long as we can. OK, the, this was a Sigler again, and he confirmed the, uh, an observation that the pallidly displaced canines are not associated with narrow maxillas. Uh, the pallidly displaced canines with full root or apex closure, then if you get them, uh, clearly there's less probability of them erupting on their own. So I want to talk about this for a minute. Non-surgical impaction treatment technique. Now, before I go on to all this, here's our goal. We want to make sure, we want to try for any impaction to erupt in the mouth with no surgery or minimal surgery where maybe it is now in a position where it's slightly, it's labial, and the only thing covering it is a little soft tissue, which can, can be taken off with a, a laser in no time. OK? That's the goal. All right, so what do we need? We need a, a diagnosis out of a patient at an early age. What does that mean? Well, you know chronologic age and dental age do not, re, uh, they don't re, equilibrate one to the other at all. But when I say early age, I mean an early dental age. You want, if possible, one-third of the root formation or left, less, if possible. You place your rapid expander. You extract a deciduous tooth in the eruption pathway. And then you activate the, rapid, the maxillary expander until the palatal cusps hit the, the buccal cusps of the mandibular first molars. You leave the TPA in for approximately four months, three, four, whatever. And the reason for it is you're opening up the suture. You want that suture material. You want it to, to heal with more bone in place there. OK? All right. You then remove the rapid expander, and you let the buggle segments relapse into a normal cusp fossa relationship. You re-radiograph to see what you've got and what's there and assuming everything is normal and okay. You re-expand the maxillary arch if necessary. You band and bond your teeth. You retain your re-expanded arch wire. Now you can leave in the expander is one way to do it or you can put a palatal arch in which will get you out of the way of all the stuff that's going on in the front of the mouth. You want to upright the roots adjacent to the impaction that is appropriate to create enough room and arch. You will see one of the cases here where I know at least one, where we took the lateral incisor and tipped it, weight the root too far mesial because I wanted the, the tips of that, that tooth out of the way when the canine came in. Let me make clear. Don't do, you don't want tipping. You don't want this. You want that. So there's enough room. OK. Now, this is the very first patient I ever treated with his technique. I'll give you a little background. She's, her father's a dentist in Milford. Um, he's an interesting guy. And he brought her in, and she was about seven or eight. And if you look at this, I would suggest to you that this is a pretty good looking mouth. I mean, oh, I'm sorry, I did, a ba I did a baddie. Wait a second. Oh, come on. I'm sorry, I did a baddie. OK. I would suggest that this is a, an OK class one. We've got a deep overbite. And this is an eh, OK class one. She's got a deciduous tooth missing here. She's got a very straight con and actually concave profile and a cute kid. All right. So I took an x-ray, and this is what I found, or what was there. We're congenital. What did I do again? I shut the whole thing off? <laughs> How did I do that? It was Malloy. It was Malloy. 
You got it. Who said that? He's right. So, we've got a missing permanent second by here, a missing permanent second by there, and missing permanent second by here. Okay? We've got a horizontal impaction of a canine, and we've got this, and you can see the tip of the deciduous tooth is, extends beyond the crown of the permanent canine up here. Now, what does that tell you up here? Help me. What does this mean when you see that the deciduous root is still there and, ex and extends beyond the crown of any tooth? Come on. I'm sorry? Right, that's, that's obvious, yes. What else does it tell you? Well, yes, it, it's true. It is a, the, the point is that you can't put things, two things in the same place at the same time. Therefore, since the canine, the, the, the permanent canine should be right over the root, if, unless I, I miss my guess, of the, per, of the deciduous canine, if I see the root of the deciduous on an x-ray extend beyond the crown, the permanent tooth is displaced somewhere. It's got to be, okay? All right, so, good. So we, well, I want to get into this a little further. Daddy, who is a hunter and a fisherman and a tough guy, he turned whiter than the sheet. And he said, oh my God, we're going to have all surgery and we got these problems and so forth and so on. And I said to him, listen, Carl, this is early 70s. You can tell the, everything's black and white. And I, you know, so I said to him, I've got an idea. I don't know if it's going to work, but this thing's been bugging me for years. Would you allow me to try to treat your daughter without her needing any permanent extractions? Or if she needs, doesn't have to have any uncoverings, no surgery, no nothing. And he said, oh, can you do that? And I said, I really don't know, but I'd like to try. Okay, so that's the beginning of all of with this, and that's why I'm showing this case to you now. Okay, so let's see what's happened. This canine is turned a ton. It's turned a ton. We've gotten the deciduous tooth out here. We've maintained these because we should, um, and we watch it as it goes. This is another exp expander that we put in, and I'm going to tell you what I think is happening, but I'm not sure, but you can go home because it's anecdotal, and you could say that guy open didn't know what he's talking about. It's probably true. Um, but look what's going on, okay? And this is the finish. And you might ask the question, what happened to the deciduous molars? The dentist, the doctor, her father decided to take them out. Didn't ask me, just did it. We did close up the space, however, up here where there was a missing bicuspid. And this is the finish. And you could argue the finish is good, bad, or indifferent, but what I think we gave them a good service by being, allowing that tooth to erupt in a normal way simply by Double expansion. Now, I want to get back to this double expansion business. You can see, excuse me a second, I want to get a little water. Good water up here, boy, I'll tell you. I need lots of it. Anyway, the the fact that we can eliminate the surgery, to me, is a big deal. I think it's a big deal for a couple of reasons. If nothing more than the cost factor and the emotional issues that are involved with it. Um, anytime you have any kind of a problem of health, whatever it is, and they're not, a patient's not aware of it and you've got to bring it to their attention, they're not happy, and I don't blame them. 
Anyway, this young lady is now uh, married. She's got two kids. Uh, she's a nurse. And um, so that was the very first time I ever did this. If you go to the literature, you will see people talking about headgears and or expanders. Okay? Nobody talks about, however, a doing it a second time if necessary. You put that in your pocket and you hold it because it's going to be good to, you're going to use it and you're going to go, wow. So don't, that's the whole key to, I would have never gotten this in one expansion and I did exactly what I told you and it did work. So let's take a look at a couple more of these little sweethearts. Okay. This is her at beginning. And there's your finish, and that is that. I also suggest, because there's talk of this all the time in the literature of a periodontal issue of an impacted canine, primarily a maxillary is what they're talking about, that when they come in on the mesial, you have a defect. There could be a lot of reasons for that, but I'd suggest to you, and I can't prove it, so you're going to leave here and say, well, never mind what you're going to say. But I would suggest to you that when you do this and the tooth comes in with no surgery, you're not going to have that problem. Okay? Okay, now this little sweetheart here is one of my most interesting patients psychologically. He's the, the youngest of three kids. Mother is a dental hygienist. <laughs> he loved Laffy Taffy. He would break things every visit. And I said to him, you can't do this. And he looked at me and said, why not? <laughs> why not? I love Laffy Taffy. So, <laughs> anyway, he comes in looking like this. And here we got a very lovely upper horizontal impaction, a deciduous lateral incisor, I'm sorry, a peg lateral incisor behind it, another lateral incisor mesial to it, um, and no missing teeth, but we've got this lovely situation. So you could see here, we, for our first expander we put in, and the canine did turn, but we've got that permanent lateral, or what's made this pig-shaped tooth here, is right smack in our way, okay? Um, so, we had it extracted. This is, I'm not sure why, because this looks worse than the first picture. Wonderful, okay. But here it comes, and we had the tooth extracted. Of course, the other tooth was no problem, so we're now missing two uh, lateral incisors. And also, we've got here, this lower right canine is rotated about 90 degrees, trying to get in, and we've got, uh, we got a crowding problem down here. Uh, you could claim this is ankylosed. Um, it probably is in this but they do come out, and rather than put them through anything, especially a youngster like him, um, I just let it ride, and it worked out. Okay, so here she comes. Teeth. No, look at this angel. I mean, come on, how could he not? Look, it's just, I'm the, I'm, <laughs> he came to our, um, a dental meeting to talk about, it in, uh, he's, He's now probably in his young 30s, and he um, wanted to talk to us about his investment, something or whether, and I said, do you want me to tell this group of dentists what you did to me? <laughs> and he says to me, please be nice, please be nice. Got to be a psychiatrist besides an orthodontist, so help me. Anyway, there's the tooth in the mouth. On here, 
and that's what we got when we put the lowers on. And I don't want two of them, I want just one. Okay, now if you look at the bottom, the mandible, you will say, oh my God, and the occlusion and blah, blah. Well, he's only got three lower incisors. We had to take one out. He was actually class three. And uh, we, uh, it worked out quite well otherwise than that. Uh, even though he's a class three, you'll note that the uh, molar is in class two position. But that's because, of course, he's missing his two permanent laterals. OK. This you will hear about tomorrow. That is my love of loves. That's Cooper. And this is what he does. And let me tell you something. We get, I swear, it's people come in to see us, and they don't even care who we are, what we are, et cetera. I would like to ask this group, how many of any of you have had a parent once come in and ask to, and tell you, I want to know if you're board certified? OK, you've got a few. How many have asked, have asked you, um, where'd you gra graduate and did you graduate in the top 10% of your class? Well, I can tell you one thing. This, this four-legged ma marvel, they talk about them in church. This is no lie. I mean, I've heard things go on. And so Gary's going to talk about this tomorrow, and he's also going to talk a little craniofacial stuff for you that are still here. But that, that animal is unbelievable, and he makes a hell of a difference. You're going to find out tomorrow he's not only a certified medical therapy dog, I mean legit, not you've sent in for, he's also a first responder. So that if there is another 9-11 uh, or any of this kind of stuff, there are nine dogs in the state, they go. And uh, so, but that's a whole other issue. Okay, another case. All right, another one of these little sweethearts. Um, same kind of setup, congenitally missing by cuspid. Uh, I think in his case, this was the only one. Second molars were not a problem, but the wisdom teeth, you better believe, are going to be trouble. So we did the same stuff. And the tooth looks like it turned, and here it comes. And there is pretty much the finish. That is the finish. He's got, still got, you see the uh, deciduous molar? There's nothing holding it, but that's what's there, and I have no problem with it. And so we'll see where that goes. Now this is, uh, this young lady is very interesting. I treated her sister before her, and she's cute. I mean, I, I, at least in my eyes, she's a, a cute kid, but, but, she did not want any front teeth missing when she's going to school to see her boyfriend, blah, 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 blah. So I tried this, well, I'll show you what we had to deal with. So we got a couple of these babies. It's, I'm sorry, it's not more clear, but here's the, the trout route there and the route there. Um, peg shaped. Missing teeth, two teeth here. Lateral, I'm sorry, lateral, one tooth. She's missing a tooth here, and she's missing a tooth here. This, the deciduous tooth here is almost ready to be exfoliated and blah, blah, blah. So, we did the usual. You'll notice we did not take out the deciduous teeth because between she and her mother, it was going to be a problem. And <laughs> like I say, you know, you get all the answers. You think you know what you're doing. You know the mechanics of it. But you've got to be a psychiatrist. So we waited. And fortunately, the tooth did, it did, a, uh, did come down to this point. And then she said, OK, I'm ready. You can take it out. So we did. And you could see that this tooth from up here is coming down here, and there's less overlap 
of the deciduous uh, lateral incisor. And of course here it's not a problem. It is resorbing and coming straight down. This is a finish. And she's missing a tooth here, so. Oops, sorry, I did it again. So, we made her an Essex retainer with a tooth in it. And she's going to get a, a Maryland Bridge. The father is a, a chief mechanic at a Chevy agency. I treated him as a kid. And those are the kinds of people they really, if you've done a, if you've reached them, regardless of how good or bad your, your result is relative to board uh, uh, specifications, if you reach them up here, and they, they think you walk on water, okay? And the father was that kind of guy, because they came a distance to see her, see us. Anyway, so I think this case came out kind of nice. That's my hobby, folks. I like to restore antique four cars, and that is a 1904 Oldsmobile. Um, and it's kind of fun when you put them in, you know, you go in parades. Harry, you've always been my friend. <laughs> you know, uh, I, my, one of my closest friends is a je retired dentist who lives in New Jersey, Sandy Rubenstein. And um, the way he calls me on the phone is as follows. He'll ring, I'll pick up the phone, I say hi, or hello. He says, is this the oldest full-time practicing orthodontist in the history of the world. <laughs> and I said, I might be, I don't know. I'm down to six days a week, folks. And I, I, I do, I have a lot of things I love to do, and I'm sure you do as well. I don't look forward to retirement, I don't. Because I wanted to be an orthodontist when I was 12. My father was a physician, my mother was a lawyer, and I wanted to be an orthodontist. And my mother was on my, can my case a lot. You go in dad's practice, he was an ENT specialist, and you'll go there and blah, 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 blah. And I said, Ma, I'm going to be an orthodontist. And um, a few years later, I'm here. And that, in fact, I will tell you, and this is true, I believe I am the luckiest man you will ever meet in your entire life. And part of the reason for that is I get to know people like you in this audience because you should be very proud of what you do and I'm proud of you, okay? So I have to make a choice. You store in a car, fishing, spending time with the grandkids who don't want to, they're 12 and 14, so it's, oh, Pop's here, hey, Pop, I need a new blah, 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 blah. You got it, I need a, you, you got it, and uh, so forth. The thing I love to do most is what we're doing here today. So, uh, and I certainly am grateful to, for, for Dr. Miller to allow me to speak to you because it's an honor and a privilege. Okay, next one of these cases. We've got a big diastema. Mother comes in, this is why she's here. And we take a, a panoramic x-ray. And there you go, and we've got, let's see what we got today. Okay, we're missing a wisdom tooth here, a wisdom tooth here, a wisdom tooth here, and probably another one there. Um, she's got a very large diastema. Uh, this impaction is nasty. This one is not bad at all. And you've got all your teeth present otherwise. Okay. So, we put some uh, brackets on, and we've got this. Now, let me just tell you what you just saw. If you look here, this says left. If I go back, you'll see that's left. So guess what, folks? I bought a new x-ray machine. OK. And uh, of course, the, the wisdom teeth are now showing up, and they're going to be nasty problems, whatever. So this is almost the finish of the teeth coming in. Same idea. Now, look at this canine, because it's, you know, it's not what you want to see, but it's in the mouth. And once it's in the mouth, 
you can, and the brushing could be a ton better because of all this, but you can grab this thing and bring it down and you're a big hero. So this is her finish. Okay, and we go on. And this is what the x-ray looks like. And now we got four unerupted wisdom teeth. Okay, another case. And we got a, another, what I consider nasty up here. This one's not a sweetheart either. But we've got that going on. Now, the, interestingly enough, um, she is missing a permanent lateral here. And I think she's missing one there. But we'll see. Okay, so we did the expansion, the usual stuff. And this tooth, the nasty, this, this little sweetheart up here is turning again, okay? This one, which didn't look too bad. Well, I think this was the bad one. And, but either one, either way, they're, they're, they're swinging around. You remember the word I used before? Be patient. Be patient. Let this thing happen. It may take a year. It could take a year and 14 months, but let it do its thing, okay? So, let's go on. Okay. All right, now, you remember I told you one of these teeth I had tipped to the mesial, right here, this lateral. I want it out of the way so this thing can come down. This has to be upright and gotten, at, gotten out of the way as well. Because, but I haven't bracketed it yet. Okay. This young lady's father is a big muckamuck in the Colgate Corporation. And unfortunately, uh, the corporation decided that Connecticut and he did not belong together. So he went out to California. But uh, she, she actually kept Cooper overnight uh, a couple of times for us, simply because uh, we need, I've never put him in a uh, kennel. Uh, he would not like it. He would whine and wail and whatever. But I'll leave Gary to tell all those stories. So we got this very pretty young lady comes in to see us, and mother's not happy the way the teeth look, and uh, I can certainly understand why. So we take an x-ray, and again, we got this little sweetheart up here and this one here. And this is bad. So the first thing we did was, oh, and by the way, that's right, there are two of these I got. And you can see, if you look closely, this is one canine way up here, and the other one's right there, okay? So it's coming uh, almost straight across, down some, but it's there, okay? So this is her, again with expansion. Got a lower lingual in, and that was because she had a unilateral crossbite. Um, I don't know how you treat these. I'm gonna get that out in a minute, but I'd like to get some information about that. You could see these teeth if you look carefully. I'm sorry, one's there and one's there. And uh, you can see where they came, how far they have come, and in the direction they've come. And this is the finish, and I think that's a pretty good finish. Um, but again, we didn't have to do any surgery, didn't extract anything, nothing. And uh, she's a little bit concave, but uh, very attractive young lady. Now, I want to talk to your group, and I have questions for you. Gary's got, what time, what time am I done? Ooh. Okay, I got a quick question for everybody. Can you tell me how, if you've got a unilateral crossbite, okay, you got a unilateral crossbite, and you're gonna expand them. Yes, Gary, I see you. And you're gonna expand them. You're like, you're, he's like my mother, it's okay. I got it, he, he hates to be late in the office, you should see, but that's okay. I'll run through the rest in a hurry. What do you do when you expand these unilaterals? Do you just go in there and expand them? Do you have any force to keep the good side that was not expanded um, 
to go out buckle and the other side is, I, I, what do you do? You know what, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna hold that till later on because I'm late and I can't be late because the big man's coming. I'm just, the, you know, the introductory act. So uh, <laughs> what can I tell you? Anyway, so this is what we started with and here's our finish. And there's a Cooper again with one of those patients. This is a unique patient. I've never seen this before or again. And I'll show you why. I have never seen one of these high horizontals going backwards. Never. How, have any of you had a case like this? You've got one? Yeah, a few of you. But I've never seen one other than, so we went and did the same thing with this case. Four months, 11 months, if we start the second RME and we've got that in, we had taken out the first one, let it resolve or re, uh, go back to normal occlusion. And you could see the transpallal arch in there. And look what's going on. And there you go. Okay, there's the beginning, and here's your end. Now, again, we've got a blocked out canine here, so we zipped out one lateral. Here's her finish. I guess the braces added a lot to her eating habits. And there's another one of my cars I restored. Okay, so the goal of all this is to improve the interosseous position of the palatally displaced canines in the mixed dentition. That's what you want to do. Always take a pan before debonding. This is not my case, but I love it. Look at all this. What, so the old answer is nothing surprises me anymore. Nothing. Thank you very much. And George Santiana, who's one of my heroes, he said, the wisest mind is something yet to learn. He also said, he who does not uh, study history is condemned to repeat it. And uh, I repeat that all the time. And we thank you very much. Perry, we'd like to thank you very much for the, your, your lecture. It's been great, and uh, and I've learned a lot about impacted canines, and uh, and and I've I've done a lot of these like this. It works, and you just have to be a little patient with it. And I've also had one upside down, and after expansion, it turned and came back down. Also, surprised me, really surprised me. So with that, we'd like to present you with this medallion as our thank you for the for the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you for appreciate it. Thank you. Now, come on up. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it very much. Um, it's I an do. honor. Well, thank you. It's true. You get to speak before this group. Yeah. Kidding me. Okay, we. Are, I believe we're going. To we should have our, our uh, business meeting now and in, in, introduction or in. Okay, we're going to start our business meeting right now.